Glad you're all here today. Welcome to Fayette Baptist Church on this beautiful day. But I'm really glad someone else is here, and that is God. God is here. Psalmist said, where can I flee from his presence? Because this whole line of things, and you can't flee from his presence. But God is here. He's here in spirit and in truth. He's here in his word. And more importantly, he's here in the hearts and minds of those that are his, that believe, that are born again in the spirit. And he's here doing a wonderful work, isn't he? In and through your lives, through the lives of Teen Challenge that's with us today. Um, That's just evidence that God is here. We see it in reality in everyday living. So we thank you, God, that you are here. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we acknowledge your presence in our midst. And we call it God's sightings when we think, see things that you are doing that are beyond man's ability to change. And you change the hearts and minds of men and women and children. You take us from being a bond slave to sin to a bond slave of righteousness, Lord, which is so freeing. It's the greatest freedom we'll ever experience to be walking with you. And sense your presence. May we worship you in return in spirit and in truth, acknowledging that you are here and you are doing a wonderful work. We thank you, Lord Jesus, and pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and worship him.
Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Yes, Lord, you are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. 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 Oh, that is who you are. 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 Cause you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Amen. Amen. When I walk in the valley of the shadow of death, your perfect love is casting out fear And even when I'm caught in the middle of the storms of this life I won't turn back, I know you are near And I will fear no evil That is coming for a heart that holds on A glorious light beyond all compare And there will be an end to these struggles But until that day comes We'll live to know you here on the earth And I will fear no evil For my God is with is with me. Whom then shall I fear? Oh, whom then shall I fear? Oh no, who never let go through the calm and through the storm. Oh no, you never let go in every high and every low. Oh no, you never let go, Lord, you never let go. See a light that is coming for a heart that holds on And there will be an end to these troubles But until that day comes Still I will praise you Still I will praise you
does he? In our highs and in our lows. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. Uh, so if you want, you guys can have a seat. We're actually going to be passing out communion uh, during this next song.
Well, praise God for the incredible hope and freedom that we have in Jesus. Amen. Amen. Jeff, I'm going to ask you, if you could, could you pull up the, the, I think it was the third verse we just sang, uh, then came the morning, I think was the beginning of that. I just want to start there if we could. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. His buried body began to breathe. He was dead. Like, really dead. And then he started to breathe. That doesn't happen, right? That doesn't happen. It was a miracle. It was a miracle, a display of the power of God. And out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave no longer has a claim on me. That's a powerful, powerful truth, is it not? What a, what a hope we have. We just sang, he is our living hope. Do you mean it? Yes. Wow. We have an incredible hope because of Jesus' victory over death when he rose from the grave. It means that this life isn't all there is, that there's more to it, that there's an eternal hope that we're holding on to and waiting for. It means that those who know Christ, though they die, Jesus said, they live. In fact, they're more alive than they've ever, ever been. Amen. First Peter chapter 1, verse 3, Peter said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Peter says that Christians have been born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus. But in order for there to be a resurrection, there had to be a death, right? Isaiah 53 verse 5 says that he he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our sins. And the punishment that brought us peace was laid on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. Jesus died in our place. And so when we hold this this bread and this small cup of juice, there's so much more than that, aren't they? They're meant to remind us of the extraordinary sacrifice that Jesus made on our behalf. Jesus said, do this as often as you do it in remembrance of me. Communion is a time to remember. Unfortunately, sometimes it becomes just something that we do once a month, right? It becomes, it becomes like old habit maybe sometimes, but it shouldn't, right? This, this is meant to symbolize the greatest sacrifice that's ever been made on your behalf, the broken body and the blood poured out for you. The opening words of the song that we just sang, how great the chasm that lay between us. Talking about us and God, right? There was a chasm between us. How high the mountain that I could not climb. You recognize that that was a chasm. That was a distance that you couldn't do on your own. It's been said that we had a debt that we could not pay, but he paid a debt he did not owe. Our sin separated us from God, but Jesus paid the price to bring us back into a relationship with God the Father. The Bible tells us in not just Matthew, but also in Mark and also in Luke, all three of the synoptic gospels, all three of them say that Jesus died on the cross, and when he died, there was an earthquake. And when that happened, the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom. And the veil, of course, was, the, was this thick curtain that was put there in front of the Holy of Holies, the place where God the Father dwelt, his presence, separating him from the people to protect them, right? But when Jesus died, the veil was torn from top to bottom. Torn. Wasn't torn by people. It was torn by God himself. Again, symbolizing the incredible thing that just took place with his son dying on the cross, right? 
In that moment, the separation between God and man was ripped. That now all people have access to God the Father through the death of his son, Jesus Christ. It's incredible. It's incredible. John chapter 1, verse 12 tells us that all who did receive him, who received Jesus, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Now, I believe that in this room, probably many of you would say, that's exactly what I am. I am a child of God. We've already sung that this morning. And for those of us who are his children, we take this time to remember his sacrifice on our behalf. But if you're here and you don't know Jesus, you don't know him, you've never experienced his forgiveness, you've never called out to him, why not now? Receive the incredible gift that he offers of forgiveness. Right now, right where you're seated, call out to God the Father, ask him to forgive you because of what his son did for you. Make Jesus your Lord. Say, I wanna, I wanna follow you, Jesus, for the rest of my life. You do that right now in your seat. You don't have to stand up. You don't have to walk down here. You don't have to raise your hand. Right now, in your heart, you cry out to Jesus, and the Bible says you'll become a child of God. That's incredible. Do that now. Receive his forgiveness. And then take this symbol of his death, the, the body and the blood, and then join us as we remember his sacrifice in communion. Bible tells us that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's see. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, forgive us for the times when when maybe we, we, we fail to even consider maybe that bread or that cup that we hold in our hand and the incredible significance that it holds. But now in this moment, we, we say, Jesus, thank you, thank you, thank you for the price that you paid on our behalf, making it possible for us to be reconciled to God again. Thank you for, for being willing to, to pay the price for our sins and then thank you for rising from the grave, defeating death forever. We thank you that you are our living hope and that we have hope, not just for this life, but we have hope for all eternity. Your word tells us that the one who has been set free is free indeed, and we we believe that. We believe that because of what you accomplished in dying for our sins and rising from the grave, that we can have victory over the sin in our life, and we can have hope for eternal life with you in heaven. God, we pray over the rest of this service, we pray that you would be glorified. And we pray that you would move in the hearts of of the people here. That each one of us would know the freedom that is available through your son, Jesus. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus, our savior. Amen. Just wanna close with this and we're gonna sing one more song. Jesus went on to say that whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, that you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That you're proclaiming that he didn't just die, he didn't just rise from the dead, but he actually ascended to heaven and he's coming again. He's gonna come back. Do you believe it? You better believe it. And guess what? If you don't, it doesn't change it. He is coming back. He's coming back. So we proclaim the good news that there is a living hope available to everyone who puts their faith in Jesus Christ. We have so much to be thankful for. And I hope that your hearts are filled with thankfulness at this time. In Colossians chapter two, Paul says, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught 
and overflowing with thankfulness, overflowing with gratitude. So as we sing this next song, my heart's prayer for you has been that, that as we sing this next song, that, the, that, that what you were holding in your hand just a moment ago, that that is still in your mind, it's still in your heart, praising God and thanking him for what he has done. All my words fall short I got nothing new How could I express All my gratitude I could sing these songs As I often do Lord Jesus, we do praise you, Lord. We are so grateful. We're so thankful for your sacrifice on your behalf. We thank you, Lord, that we get to be together this morning, um, worshiping you as one body. And Lord, 
I just pray that your Holy Spirit would move mightily in this place today, Lord. I pray whether it be through your still small voice or through the mighty wind of your spirit, Lord. Um, bring a hurricane, if that's what it takes, to break the entanglements you have in our lives, Lord, to bring healing and hope to brokenness, Lord. We're going to hear some testimonies today, and I pray for the men who are here to give us those testimonies, Lord, your strength and your courage and your boldness. But Lord, we confess that we are caught up in all kinds of addictions, Lord, big and small that distract us from you, from your presence, for your true purpose for our lives. And Lord, so set us all free here this morning. In your name we pray, amen. amen. You may be seated. So these nice gentlemen are going to collect your communion elements, and while they do that, I have a few announcements to tell you about. We have the Women's Fall Retreat coming up at the end of September, the 29th and 30th, and that's going to be in Brooks, Maine at Fairhaven Camps. The men in this church have done a fantastic job um, really bringing people together with armor bearers. We're not quite to that scale, but we're giving you something different and special this year, and we hope that you will join us. Um, whether you're a new believer or you've been following the Lord for a long time, it's helpful to understand the journey that God takes us on and those disciplines that help us to grow closer to God. And so we're going to explore that um, in this teaching and with Thrive Ministry they're going to really bring that to life for us through some experiential learning. And right now I'm going to break down every reason, ladies, why you've said, nope, can't do it. Okay? So first of all, um, I don't like to drive that far. No problem. We can find carpooling for you. Um, number two, uh, I can't afford the $85 registration fee, which includes three meals, by the way, and overnight. But that's okay. We've got scholarship money for you. I don't know if I can do all of the experiential learning. Is that going to be above my fitness level? No problem. There's going to be accommodations for everyone, and you can always just observe. And finally, and this is, I think, the most important for all you ladies. So it's that I can't take the time away. There are people that need me. You know, there are people that I care about that need Jesus, and I just need to be there with them. Well, our greatest ministry is from the overflow of what God is doing in our lives. And so I just really want to encourage you and husbands, elbow your wives, sign them up, um, whatever it takes. I hope that you'll join us. So it's open for anyone from 13 to 100. So come on out. See me at the information desk if you need help signing up for that. Grief Share starts this week on Tuesday at 6 o'clock right here at the church. If you haven't already signed up for that, there's a sign up at the information desk. Next, we have the Equip class coming up, and Pastor Jeff is going to be teaching us about this pride movement and how do we respond as Christians. You know, one thing I think the pride community does really well is they provide a place of belonging, a place of acceptance, but it's counterfeit, right? The true place of belonging is in Christ. So how do we as believers respond in a way um, that brings God's love, but also brings truth. So I hope you'll come out to that. That starts this Wednesday at, I believe, 6 o'clock, but I didn't bring my glasses. I think you can read that. Um, and next, um, we do have, as you know, Adult and Teen Challenge here with us. We're delighted to have them. We will take a love offering um, for them. Actually, it's going to be in the envelopes that are in the back of the sanctuary. I spilled my communion elements on this. So yours won't look like this, but I missed my white pants, so there is <laughs> a happy story with that. But um, So put your offering in the love en uh, offering envelope or in the boxes that are above and below and in the cafe, or you can uh, see them at their table and drop it in there, and they have some fantastic things for sale as well. Um, so that's really how the Lord supports this ministry, is through your offerings. So we just pray that you'll give generously to that as you're able. You can join us after in the cafe. I just told you, you can see their table. You can also come out for coffee and refreshments. Hope you'll do that. And um, two last things that I don't have slides for. Uh, the clothing closet and the food pantry are open today after the service over in that area of the church. Um, go see them. And the 7 to 10-year-old kids today are going to stay in the service and hear the testimonies. And that's it. You may, children, other children may be dismissed for Sunday school and take a few minutes to greet one another. You unravel me. 
with a melody you surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God I'm no From my mother's womb, you have chosen me. Love has called my name. I've been born again into your family. Your blood flows through my veins. And I'm no longer. Well, great song to lead us into the testimonies that we're about to hear. No longer slaves to fear, we're children of God and uh, been set free. But for what purpose, right? To bring Him glory. And, uh, and, and for the last several years, I don't even know how many years it's been now. I, I, I'm not really sure, but I, it's got to be more than five. Um, it, it's probably significantly more than that. But we've been uh, having... Adult and Teen Challenge come in August for several years now, uh, coming to share about their ministry and to share testimonies of what God is doing. Uh, I think that the world needs to know that, that there's a God who can set them free and that there is power available to those who want it. Reach out to Jesus. He can change your life. 
not only, as I said before, not only for now, but for all eternity. And so we have been blessed to have Adult and Teen Challenge here for, for several years. And it's to the point now, seriously, where I have people coming up to me, ask me, when is Adult and Teen Challenge coming to present uh, this year? What, what Sunday is it going to be? Because I want to be here. I want to bring a friend or, you know, so uh, this is a really special Sunday. We look forward to it every year. And as it's already been mentioned, I want to encourage you to be prayerfully considering, again, if you're able, how might God want you to help support the ministry that Adult and Teen Challenge is doing uh, as a special gift to that ministry? And again, the, the option to do that, you can either stop at the table afterwards. Uh, and if you haven't been out there yet, wow, they have some beautiful like cutting boards and rolling pins and just some beautiful stuff that they've, they have here to help support the work that they're doing there. Uh, but also we have uh, envelopes in the back, just uh, the, the love offering envelopes. Just put your, your gift in there, put it in the box, and uh, we will make sure that that gets to, to them. So at this time, I'm going to invite Scott, I believe, to come up, and they're going to take over from here. I don't, okay, we're good to go. Um, wow, what a worship, what an opening. Thank you, worship team. Thank you so much. I do have to speak for the guys, however. You cut out a pretty important part in gratitude, didn't we? You know? I mean, come on. Don't be a bashful soul now. But uh, thank you. And we're afforded the opportunity to go out each week and do a presentation and experience worship throughout the state. There are key places that we go or that are amazing. This, without question, is one. Walking in, you just feel it, you sense it, you sense it in the people that we're talking to, the people that we're seeing. And then when you come into the, to the sanctuary, if I close my eyes, I almost think I'm back at the center in our sanctuary because of the feel. You just feel the presence of God, and it's amazing. So I want to thank Pastor Chris and Sister Jen for having us here as well. They're both huge supporters. I know that thank you as a congregation that you are as well. And uh, I think it's been seven or eight years that we've been coming and doing a, uh, a presentation here. I just hope that we can live up to the expectations of the past and maybe even supersede that. We'll, we'll see. But at Adult and Teen Challenge, we exist to bring life-changing hope to the addict, myself, my brothers with me, but you all as well the families and the friends, because we're not just affecting ourselves, we're affecting everyone around us, our community, our children, which is without question the most difficult part, and our families. <clears throat> we're uh, one of 12 centers in New England and New Jersey here in Maine. We're under the 501c3 um, nonprofit organization as well. Um, we're on about 400 acres just up the road, less than 10 miles away, Sturdivant Hill, Right now, we're about 22 to 24 beds capable, and I'm sure as a lot of you know that attend here every week, we're working on the White House, the infamous White House. Well, the work did actually start. I can confirm it. You can see it. Um, we started back in end of January, beginning of July. The entire building's been gutted. There's been exterior addition foundations put on. They're working on it like crazy. So that's going to take us from 24 beds to up to 34 beds. 22 to 24 in the main house, but uh, when the house is up and running, we're looking at 10 to 12 more lives that could be saved, 12, 10 to 12 more families that can be reunited, 10 to 12 more people that come to Christ, that submit and come to Christ and are obedient to the Lord, and that's a beautiful thing. When you can pass that on to someone, and that's, that's what we do. We are a Christian discipleship that uh, it's our priority, it's our job to do this for ourselves but for others. So the, the program it originally was 12 to 15 months. It's now been tailored down to 12, 10 to 12 months. We looked through the research and through that period of time realized that if someone is really putting the effort in and understand that at 12 months you can get everything you need and that's the beauty of it. And as I said, we are a Christian discipleship, so everything is based in the Bible, uh, character qualities and uh, script mems and so forth, and just how we carry ourselves generally. I'll get to that in the rest of the presentation. And we're structured to bring the resident to the realization that you need Christ in your life. You need the Lord. You need some faith. 
Because let's face it, the world out there right now, it's a scary place. It's a scary place, and they're scary people. So we have four key elements to the program, beginning with the practical daily living. And at Adult and Teen Challenge, the staff and the entire organization are responsible for managing each resident's daily needs. So we live in shared dorm rooms. Anyone that's been to college here understands a shared dorm room. If you don't understand, well, okay, we're going to take this section right here. We're going to put you in the house. And you all live together. You share a bathroom. There's two bathrooms right now in the house that work for 15 guys. We have about half an hour to get ready in the morning. That makes it a little difficult. So within, say, 30 days, character is going to come out. We're going to have some arguments. There's going to be, there's going to be some attitudes. Um, it's just how it works. But in that practical daily living, it's just teaching you how to be human again. Personal care, personal hygiene, um, taking care of your belongings, keeping living spaces clean and so forth. But the other aspect of the center and the staff taking care of us is any appointments that we need to go to, any court hearings, lawyers meetings, probation, things along those lines, you're going to get a ride there. And you're going to get there on time, most of the time. There's some of the guys that like to be 10 minutes late to everything, but uh, that staff, that is. We can't be late because we're held accountable for everything. But uh, if you need it, they'll get it done one way or another. If someone has to take time off from a day they have off, say time schedule with their family, they'll get it done one way or another. Ultimately, it does come down to us in the house, however. We're responsible for the day-to-day -day running. We all do the jobs within the house. We clean the bathrooms. We do the meals. We take care of the property. That's just how it works. The second aspect of the program is educational, and that's probably the most important aspect to build a foundation of faith in that understanding of the Bible. And uh, each individual comes in at the beginning, the first three months and then three to six months, you have a basic contract that's written out. So you're learning scripture memorization, you're learning character qualities of Christ. And I'm talking, some of these script mems are anywhere from 25 words to, I think my last one was 119. But it's important because it builds that basis that an individual needs to fall back on. When you're having trouble, there's a lot of us in here, in this room, in this sanctuary, that fall back on the word. It strengthens us. That's what it's there for. It's the truth. So as well as the character qualities is reading, required reading that we do, and do book reports and so forth, and other um, aspects of that. As you move on in the program, between six months and a year, the contracts are individualized to the person that's receiving them. So say you need extra help in an area of grieving, then your contract is going to be geared toward grieving. Or if you need extra help in a pride area, then your contract's going to be geared toward that. If you show improvement in those areas when the contract is finished, then you're going to move forward. If you don't, you're going to get a lot more paperwork by the time it's said and done. So toward the end of the program, you're moving into the fifth phase. We've tailored that now. It's the fourth phase, and that's called APEC, where you're looking to the future. You're looking to see what you're going to be doing after the program's finished. Um, they're working with job placement. You're going to get um, some sessions with a life coach, and that's actually Pasco Manzo. He's the uh, president, uh, CEO of Adult and Teen Challenge New England, New Jersey. It's his daughter that actually does the, um, the life coaching. And you end up, I think it's seven sessions. At the end of those sessions, by the time you're finished the program, you're actually certified as a life coach. So you could take that and apply it in other areas in your life when you go out. You could do life coaching, say, at churches or other organizations where someone may need it. You also, at the end of the program, when you graduate, there is an opportunity to do two six-month apprenticeships. And what that would be is you're not necessarily a staff member, but you're helping out with the daily um, workings of the program. You're helping students. You're mentoring people. You're also giving back to the program. You know, there are people that came into this program who go out every day and raise funds, who go out and talk, who do things that are done behind the scenes that no one sees. These guys sitting in front of me do things. They don't do it because they're asked. They do it because they want to. 
And that's part of what builds in the program. It builds that, that self-assurance in a person to just go ahead and do it because you know it needs to be done, but you're not looking for praise for it. You're not looking to be rewarded for it. You're doing it on to the Lord because you're doing it for your brothers as well, and you're doing it for those in the community just like this. You don't get to refuse to come out on church services. A few people have because they can't speak or whatever else, but they're put into a different slot in the program so that everyone is contributing. And that's where the third aspect of the program comes in, and that's vocational training. There's all sorts of different jobs throughout the house, not just the day-to-day -day that we do every meal, cleaning up the kitchen, doing dishes and so forth, cleaning our areas. You have cooking, three meals a day, and snacks. And in case you couldn't tell, some of us probably don't need snacks. We still do it. We try to stay healthy. There's a joke, a standing joke that I, I heard when I came in, that 30 and 30. So in other words, in 30 days, you're going to gain 30 pounds. That's not a joke. It's a truism. But uh, so within that, one of the, the jobs in the house is cooking and basic sanitary uh, workings of the kitchen, basic food prep and so forth. A lot of guys coming in don't even know how to cook, haven't cooked any more than maybe a hot dog or done mac and cheese or most of us microwaved food. Well, most people. I was afforded a long time ago to be stuck in my mother's face in the kitchen when I was a kid cooking, always asking questions so, and working in restaurants. So I had that chance, but other things I didn't, working with computers. I've had to pick that up over the past few months. I've messed with computers, but that's one of the other skills that you learn. Doing church services, I'm scheduling church services constantly. I'm talking to people all the time. We're trying to find areas to go to do services. We're trying to find areas to go to do fundraising. We go out three to four times a week from Wednesday to Saturday all across the state and sell our products, the cutting boards, the rolling pins. But, you know, the monetary... All right, we'll, we'll talk about the money. Yes, it supports the program. You all support our program and the people we talk to, but that's not what it's about. It's not. It's about getting out, spreading the word, telling someone, telling a mother that there is hope for their daughter. Telling a father that there is hope for their son. Telling someone there's hope for their brother, for their sister, for their father, for their mother. That's what it's about. It's, it's our job to do this. We have a unique opportunity because we have the experience. We've been out there in the trenches. We've done it. And God loves us all, but God loves us especially because of what we're doing. And let me tell you, the enemy hates us for it. We see it every day. We're attacked from every direction. But it is our priority and it is our job to do this. And, and we take it very seriously. And we take our jobs at the house very seriously. It's... Um, it's what we have to do, and that really leads into our spiritual life, too, because if we, we all know if we're not fit spiritually, you're not going to be fit in your mind either. And that's, that's probably the biggest component, component of the entire um, program is our spiritual life. We do chapel. It should be five times a week each morning, but it's about three times, Monday through Wednesday, and we have pastors come in and speak, which I need to get up with you and see if I can get you to come in and talk to us. Even if I can only steal you for an hour, which is what we usually do, but I'd love to have you longer than that. And anyone else would love to come as well. It's very important to hear the word from all directions. We all absorb it differently. We all understand it differently. But we're afforded the unique opportunity to do that at the center. We have prayer up to three times a day. There's two mandatory, as we call corporate prayer, but it's not mandatory for us. We enjoy it. And you'll hear a presentation real quick later at the end of the PowerPoint about um, prayer cards. Please fill one out. We'd love to pray for people. It could be the smallest thing you could ask for, world peace. We'll pray for it. We guarantee it. Or if you have a loved one that's having a health issue or just a, an issue with deciding something. We're in a unique bubble on the top of the hill. We're removed from the world. We're removed from outside influences. So we're allowed to stay in the spirit all day long. Yes, we come out and do this, but it's amazing when you feel the spirit moving. It's amazing when you feel it moving within yourself, and the beauty of it, too, is seeing it in your brothers, seeing the change when someone comes in and they're still living that life that they were, seeking whatever it was that wasn't of God 
and then you see the movement. You don't see the change in yourself as much as you do your brothers usually. And then you come to the realization, wait a minute, if that's going on with them, what's going on with me? And it's a beautiful thing. I, we go around laughing about absolutely nothing a lot of times. <laughs> or other things. I mean, we're, we're great at throwing each other under the bus. That's, that's sure, I'll tell you what. <laughs> that's um, just how it is. The other gr excellent, amazing opportunity that we have is two times a year we do a spiritual retreat or spiritual emphasis. A few months ago, we went to New York, um, an area called Camp Champ, and it's an entire compound, I guess is the only way to put it, that is owned by Teen Challenge, and they'll do different spiritual retreats, Bible studies and whatnot. But we spent uh, four and a half days there and listened to a great number of speakers. All the speakers were actually um, directors of centers throughout New England, one being our own, uh, Pastor Keith, or Keith, our director, gave a presentation one of the evenings. And of course, we have the opportunity to hear Keith not always once a week, but generally he comes in on Tuesdays and speaks, but it's just, it's powerful. The, the sanctuary there, the chapel there, it's an amphitheater, so it graduates down, and you put 350 like individuals, 350 former addicts in a building like that and start running praise, it is, it's, um, it, instills a lot of faith in you. You don't come away from that place not changed. It's an amazing opportunity, and anyone who had the chance definitely cherishes it. You don't walk away the same, no question. No question. It's, it's yeah. If anyone has the opportunity to go to spiritual retreat, I encourage that, obviously. I mean, I suppose you could go to Teen Challenge if you needed to, but no, no, go find another one. So it's actually said that in... 12-month program that an individual, a resident, is receiving up to 10 years of experience in church, 10 years worth of church services. That's power in itself. And even if you only absorb a tenth of that, that's a year worth of services in 12 months. So you're getting a lot out of that, and it's amazing. Part of that is, and part of the healing, is getting up and doing this. You know, it's funny because I've done this presentation four and a half months. I've probably done maybe 20 presentations. I don't get nervous. I didn't get nervous the first time I got up and done, had done it. Coming up here, I had the jitters. It wasn't nerves. It was the spirit. It was feeling it. It was sensing it. And it, it, it's an amazing feeling when you can fall back on one thing that will never let you down. Man will let you down. It's just un the unfortunate part of um, being human, but the Lord never will and faith never will. It strengthens our faith and it's healing for us to stand up here each week and do this. There isn't a brother sitting in front of me. There's one brother we have with us today. It's the first time he's been out. He's experiencing what will happen. All my other brothers that are here have done their, their testimony a number of times. My brother Clark has done his testimony 40 times probably, give or take. Each time there's something different. There's healing to it. There's power to our testimonies. And um, you probably heard me talk long enough. So what I'm going to do is introduce my first brother. And I love this man. You know, he's, he's been around six months. He's going into his third phase. His name is Philip Warren. He's, uh, he's an amazing individual. And I love him. He has three children that he's built a relationship back with that he won't trade for anything. So I'll turn it over to him. Amen. Hello, church. Hello. My name is Philip Warren, and uh, there's two things the Bible says about overcoming. It says we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the words of our testimony. So I'm here to give encouragement to you guys to help you overcome anybody who knows anybody that may be struggling with addiction or if you may be struggling with addiction. Let me tell you a little bit about my life. I was born in Pensacola, Florida. Uh, we moved up to Maine when I was about 11. My dad was in the Navy. I was always in the sports, wasn't really worried about drugs. I got a full scholarship to the University at Buffalo when I was uh, 18 years old. I was kicked out of the University of Buffalo for uh, smoking marijuana, and that's when my problems started. Uh, it built a chasm between me and my father because he was disappointed in me. Uh, I started selling drugs, and I was in the drug game for a while. Uh, my father got sick almost to death when I was 27, and I started using cocaine for the first time. Uh, when my dad, uh, in 2017, 
my dad passed away. And I went so far into the drug life that it was almost unreturnable. In 2018, I ended up going to prison for two years, but I didn't uh, seek God the way I should have. And I didn't address the issues that I had with my father. That I only time I addressed them was when I was high or under the influence of something. I never addressed them in a healthy way. So um, from 2020, when I got out of prison, to 2023, uh, I went to three rehabs that were secular for 30 or 60 days apiece, and nothing helped me. And uh, towards the end of 2022, I decided to move from Biddeford, Maine to Bath, Maine to uh, get closer to my kids because I thought that would help me beat my addiction. And it worked for a little bit, and then I had a death in my family, and I went off the deep end again. Um, but thank God, when I moved to Bath, I got a different probation officer, and he happened to be a pastor, and he recommended that I go to Adult and Teen Challenge in Winthrop. And I agreed to go, and then the day before I was supposed to go, I went on the run for four weeks. And uh, I was just running from God. And uh, so I was... While I was on the run, my probation officer put a warrant out for my arrest, and I missed my son's birthday, and my whole family was looking for me. And what I remember most is every now and then I, I would feel bad that my mother didn't know where I was, and I would call her, and she would say, hi, how you doing, my mighty man of valor? Like She never would say nothing negative to me. She always spoke words of faith to me. She said, you're going to pull down strongholds for the kingdom of God. That's all she would say to me, no matter what she saw. She always had faith. And uh, that's, that's probably my biggest testimony is my mother. She just never gave up on me. She always had faith in me. She always stood on the, stood on the promises of God, and she never, ever wavered. And uh, I just thank God for her right now. Um, so moving on, after I was on a, on a run for four weeks, I decided I couldn't have any peace because my mother was driving around Lewiston praying that I had no peace until I came to God. So. <laughs> <laughs> so I was miserable. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, I checked myself into the Teen Challenge, and then uh, me and uh, one of the staff members called my probation officer. And my pro probation officer, uh, he told me, well, uh, you still got to check yourself into jail because I want, I want a court order that you be there. So, you, so I'm coming off of drugs. I'm detoxing. And the last thing I want to do is go sit inside of a jail cell. So after being at Teen Challenge for four days, I left. And then I could just, I just had no peace. I couldn't, I couldn't stay going. So I uh, mustered up enough courage to turn myself into jail. So I went and hit the buzzer at the jail at about, my, my probation officer told me I had to be in jail by Wednesday or I was going to prison. So Tuesday at 11.59, <laughs> I, went to, uh, I went to the jail and I pushed the buzzer. And uh, I said, my name is Philip Warren. I want to check myself in the jail. And they said, we can't take you in unless you're arrested. So uh, they wouldn't let me inside the jail. So I, I went back outside. I got on the phone, and I called the police on myself. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> uh, and, and where I come from, it's frowned upon to even call the police on someone else. So. Uh, <laughs> I never imagined myself calling the police on myself, but thank God for the courage. So I called the police on myself, and um, the police came over and arrested me, and I went to jail. And uh, I can tell you, uh, I haven't regret that decision. Uh, you're looking at a man who could not be around my oldest daughter when I went to Teen Challenge. My two youngest kids, they, they just were unsure of me. I've always took pride in being a great father, but drugs took me away from that. Um, I had a great landscaping business, and, I, and it crumbled to the ground. I was married, and my wife left me. And uh, God has totally restored my life. Um, even though I'm not married to my wife anymore, our relationship is perfect. We get along. We put the kids first. We never argue. My kids love me. This past Thursday, even though I wasn't allowed to be around my oldest daughter, I had all three of my kids with me at Rang Pond, and that is nothing but the grace of God. And... Um, um, I'm here to tell you that if you know someone struggling with addiction, never give up hope in them. My family cut me off financially, but they never stopped loving me. They, my mother never stopped speaking life into me. She said, you're a great man. You're a mighty man of valor. You're going you're gonna to bring others to Christ. And I didn't see it at the time, 
But one quote she used to say to me all the time is she said, you have to see it before you see it or you'll never see it. And that is what faith is. You gotta see it before you see it or you never see it. And uh, I could go on forever with my testimony, but I'm gonna stop there. But the scripture that I stand on because of what God has done in my life is Psalms chapter 34, verse one through four. I will bless the Lord at all times and his praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, he'd heard me and delivered me from all my fears. Wow. Wow. I've heard his testimony a number of times, and that just moved me. And I can stand here and bear witness to the faith of his mom. She is an amazing woman, and thankfully, we just got her back last week, this past week. She was um, at his sister's, her daughter's wedding, a month and a half ago, a month ago, and had some health issues and had to stay. She just got back to the state. I got an idea. She's probably happy to be back. But um, I've seen the reunification with his family, and it brightens all of our hearts. The Lord can and will help if only asked, and he will move in mighty ways. That's the best part of my day, and being a resident in the program and seeing my brothers in the way that the Lord has moved in their life. Uh, my brother that's going to come up next, Aaron, he was actually in the program a couple of years ago, and he was on his way, you know, and then things happen, and he left, but by the grace of God, he came back. He came back, and he, you'll, you'll understand, you'll hear why he came back, and the reunification with his family. His mom never gave up either. There's something about moms to be said out there. If you haven't called your mom lately, please call her and tell her you love her. <laughs> it will help all of us, <clears throat> but... Um, it is amazing, again, to be stuck in that bubble, not stuck in that bubble, to be willfully there, to make that choice and be there and just to heal. Jehovah Shalom, God of peace. So I'm going to bring up my brother Aaron. He's from Scout Hegan. He is also in his third phase, six months in, and he's going to tell you how his life's going for him. How's it going, church? We'll try to hold it together. The Lord has me emotional today. Or, I don't know. <clears throat> All right, so my name's Aaron Butters, and I'm 35 years old, and I'm from Skowhegan, born and raised. I want to share with you how the Lord and Teen Challenge saved my life. So I had a pretty textbook childhood for the most part. My parents got divorced when I was young. My brothers and I went with my mom during the week, and my dad's on the weekend. So my brothers and I didn't have much supervision with my mom always working and only seeing my dad on the weekends. I believe that's why growing up, I've had a hard time with listening to people in authority. I've always been in trouble with the law. Uh, in seventh grade, I got expelled and attended Faith Baptist Christian School, and that's where I first heard about the Lord. And uh, I, I never took the Lord serious growing up and seemed to only go to church to see my girlfriend at the time. So by the time I got into high school, my, uh, my life was out of control, my drinking and drugging lifestyle. And I ended up getting arrested for, and just, I ended up dropping out of high school, just spiraling. Uh, so, my, and my rock bottom has been since my early 20s when I, I lost custody of my daughter for being an unfit dad and choosing the party lifestyle <clears throat> over being a father. So, for the past 15 years, all of those uh, devil-inspired poisons took me down a self-destructive path of failed relationships <clears throat> and many phone calls to my brother for bail money. Uh, the, the final straw, uh, my mess of a life was December 2022, when I had no hope. <clears throat> Saturday, I would try to end my life by jumping into the river. Uh, God had a different plan for me. I had my buddy's dog, Mary Lou, jump in with me. It started yelping and sinking, so I had to turn back. And by saving her life, she saved mine. <clears throat> uh, after a couple more weeks of walking the streets, getting high, uh, one morning the Holy Spirit just put this intense feeling of guilt 
which I'd never felt before, to come back to Teen Challenge and get my life back on track. So since uh, I've been at Teen Challenge, my life's slowly getting back to better. Uh, I've never been with, so close with the Lord, and he's given me my memory back, and he's taken away my anxiety. I would never be up on stage like this if, if it wasn't for the Lord. Uh, he's healing my lungs because I have asthma and COPD from all the drugs and... and uh, uh, also, uh, I never shared this with anyone, but I've been terrified of uh, uh, the dark my whole life. And he's, uh, I got anointed by Andy and his wife at church, and ever since then, I'm not scared of the dark anymore. And uh, yes. okay. uh, my mom and nieces have been coming every Sunday to church with me. And they've been visiting me every week. I can't thank the Lord enough for that. Uh, so I'm not quite sure where the Lord is leading me yet. But I definitely know that I want to uh, serve him for the rest of my life. and never want to go back to that sinful past life I used to live. And the, uh, the, the scripture I stand on is James 4, 8. Is draw near to the Lord and he will draw near to you. Thank you. He's not kidding either. He, he barely could stand up in front of four or five of us at the center and give his testimony. And it was, it was rough for him, but he's gotten there. And the love that he has for his family, the love that he has for his nieces, it gives us all hope. But it's not just for the family. It's the love that he has for everybody. Aaron always has a smile on his face. I say Aaron, and it's so foreign because he's, he's butters. It's not... It's, He's butters, so it just, it's inspiring. It could be the worst day, it could be yucky, whatever, and the man's got a smile on his face. He's not always laughing like this guy, but he's got a smile on his face, and it, it just reassures our faith that the Lord can do anything, anything. And that, that really brings me to the next brother I'm going to bring up, and this guy, <laughs> when I came in, nine and a half months ago, less than 10 months ago. I sort of knew what I was in for. And uh, after 50 years of doing it on my own, well, actually, I walked with the Lord when I was a kid, up until I was about 14, 15 years old. And then the pleasures and treasures of man looked much better, so I walked away. And uh, as I said, 30 years of doing it my own way, good times, bad times, not always terrible. It, did, it wasn't working. I lost everything. Family, jobs, kids, all of it. And uh, having a basis in faith, I thought I had it all figured out coming into the program. And I did to a point. You know, I had a little bit of a leg up, knowing some scripture, being in the faith and whatnot. But when I came in, it was a foreign world. And this guy here was the first one that I really started walking. They kind of, We were in the same room. We were roommates for six months, so... They kind of threw him at me, and he probably felt like I was a puppy dog for a little bit following him around, but I was just trying to get a lay of the land. Well, that's what we'll say. The first day I was there, I was thrown into prayer. Not thrown into prayer. When you first arrive, you get time to acclimate. You can see what's going on. So I went into prayer. I thought I was at a revival or something. These guys were walking around and singing and hooting and hollering and throwing their arms in the air, and you thought you were in a insane asylum for a minute until you stepped back and listened. And then my brother Clark came up to me, <clears throat> and I was at a low at this point, did not care in my life again. I'd been there a couple times in my life where it didn't matter, and um, he said, brother, can I pray over you? Yeah, sure. And I started listening to his words, and I started absorbing them, and I felt love, love that I hadn't felt. I didn't know this guy. He didn't know me. We don't know each other's background. We come from completely different worlds. But it was genuine, and you felt that it was genuine, and that's what we do for each other. So without further ado, Adam Clark is from Bridgeton, Maine. He's actually, in a week, going to be the oldest resident in the program, or the longest resident in the program. He's in 12 months, and he's just phasing up to phase five. So it's going to be an interesting world for you, brother. Thank you. Knock this off. Thank you. 
Appreciate that, Brother Scott. Um, I swear he does that just to get me to try to cry before I get up here. <laughs> you know, we we uh, we share a lot of love at the house, and it's it's genuine love. We call each other brother, and uh, we don't take that lightly at the house. You know, uh, blood might be thicker than water, but spirit is thicker than blood. So, uh, just like to apologize to you guys, we didn't get to sing today. We used to sing in the choir. Um, that could be partially my fault. I like to. Uh, Felt out the wrong lyrics above everybody, and uh, you know, I've been called the songbird of my generation. <laughs> well, maybe just by one guy. Uh, everybody else says I sound like a cat being strangled. So, uh, so to you poor unfortunate souls that were up in the front while we were singing gratitude, I apologize. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm 42 years old, about to be 43 next month. I come from a, a small town, Bridgeton. Uh, Maine. Not a lot of people know where that's from, so I have to say it's near Sebago Lake. It's southwest Maine, near the New Hampshire border. And, uh, you know, I've been uh, a year and two weeks sober now. i um, been in the program for almost 12 months. Thank you. And, uh, you know, I'm going to fast forward my childhood. You know, we all have, we all have stories. We, we, all, we all have hit bottom, you know. Um, one story I will tell about my childhood, if this gives any perspective, is that uh, while I was going to high school, um, one day I was late for the bus. Missed the bus, so, so my mom had to drop me off at school. Now, I had been going to high school for a little over a year and a half. I was more than halfway through my sophomore year of high school. Got in the car with my mother. She dropped me off at middle school. She didn't even know what school I was in. I was living with them. I, you know, I had a stepfather and mother who worked nights, were never there, never talked to me, had no idea what was going on in my life. So uh, I grew up, you know, struggling mentally, emotionally. Um, I know not now why that is. You know, I, I spent my life uh, trying to conform to the world. And uh, God calls us not to do that, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And, uh, you know, so I, I struggled a lot. I didn't understand things, didn't understand other people. Um, did it all alone, and uh, you know that led me to uh, being homeless. I didn't get along with my stepfather, so I was homeless as a teenager. Um, that really weighed on me. Uh, became suicidal. Thought about suicide every day, but thankfully I came to the Lord as a teenager, and uh, He put it on my heart to just believe that if I did commit suicide, I would go to hell. And whether that's true or not, I'm thankful for that belief as a as a kid because it's the only thing that kept me alive. I just figured, you know, life has got to get better eventually. I'll be an adult. I'll be able to do my own thing. And, and if I commit suicide, I'll never have that chance to change anything. So that kept me alive as, as a child. And, uh, you know, I became a convicted felon. Um, didn't graduate high school. Got my GED in jail. Um, life got better after that, though. I, I met a woman. Um, had everything you'd think you'd want. Had a, bought a house, two vehicles. We both had jobs. Started having kids. You know, a picture-perfect uh, picket fence type family, but uh, I wasn't going to church. I wasn't reading my Bible. Um, she was a non-believer. I uh, just was uh, not doing the things I was supposed to be doing. I got further and further away from God. I um, always smoked uh, marijuana since I was 12. Um, drinking. I used to play darts five days a week. I was in bars five days a week, so I was always drinking. Um, started doing harder drugs you know, uh, cocaine and pain medications and uh, just was slipping further and further away from what I was supposed to be doing and, you know, always searching for something to fill that hole inside me, uh, always searching for the wrong thing and, and I found it most of the time. You know, and then God decided to bless me, he decided to get me back on the right track. Uh, he blessed me a lot. He, uh, he uh, took away my best friend, died in a, a drug-related car accident. Um, got divorced, lost my house, lost my kids. Uh, both my parents died of cancer. And then my girlfriend, who I'd known for 25 years and who I was living with for three years, died in a car accident due to drugs and alcohol. And, uh, and, and you heard me right. I said he blessed me in that way because if he, if he hadn't, I would have never came back to the Lord. I'd never been where I am today. Um, he had to take all the people I leaned on in my life away from me so I could finally put my trust in him. And, uh, you know, after that, I became homeless again. 
Uh, after my divorce, I drank all the time. I drink at nine in the morning. Um, just no hope. Just, just weighed down, no hope. Decided to run from my problems instead of face them, and, and that just compounded them and made them worse. And uh, you know, got kicked out. I couldn't even be in the homeless shelter. Got kicked out of the homeless shelter for drinking and being angry. And uh, they had to put a trespass notice on me. I tried to fight the cops when they showed up, and just didn't care anymore about what happened because I, I had, like I said, no hope for the future. And I went into a crisis unit, um, tried to get into a program for drinking, and uh, God made sure no program would take me. I tried. They wouldn't answer the phone. They, they denied me. Um, they would set up phone interviews and then not answer the phone for two weeks. <laughs> I was supposed to be in a crisis unit for a week. I was in there for a month. And uh, finally put it on, on the people helping me hard to adult and teen challenge. Called them up. Noah answered right away. Um, one of our staff members, he's an amazing guy, been through the program they all have. And, oh, yeah, we got a bed. Come on in. So, you know, God made sure I landed in this program and for a reason. And, uh, you know, it says faith comes by hearing. And you hear a lot <laughs> at Adult and Teen Challenge. We do Bible study all the time. There's a lot of prayer. Um, you know, it just built my faith back up, you know, and... Uh, I came in, came in as a believer, but with doubt, still struggling with things, still trying to fit God in a box and, and in my head. And, uh, but, you know, I've learned to lean not on my own understanding, that it's, it's okay, it's good enough just to believe, just to trust in Him. And uh, now being an older resident in the program, you know, it's uh, the way I was living, the way I lived my life, it was always okay to, to let myself down. It was all right, but... Uh, you know, being, being like I said, an older guy, I got all these new guys coming in. I got people looking up to me, and it's, it's, it's not okay to let them down. So uh, that responsibility just, just given to me has helped me out a lot. You know, I have to hold up my end of the bargain. You know, God's, God's poured into me so much since I've been in the program. Um, he continues to answer prayers and bless me. Prayers, I don't even have to pray half of them. He knows what's on my heart, what I'm thinking, and he'll answer those prayers as well. And... and uh, you know, I just got to do my best to, to clean the vessel, to, to empty out of things that aren't of him, and he'll overfill my cup, and that way I can pour into these guys, and then these guys pour into other people, and it's not just, it's not just the, the, the 15, 16 beds, it's the friends, the family, and then they pour into other people, and it's a, it's a ripple effect. It's, it's far-reaching, you know. We believe that our reach should exceed our grasp, so... That, that's how it works, and, uh, I love, and the new guys teach me stuff. It's not just, it's a symbiotic relationship. These new guys come in, Brother Matt always knows when you're down, he's always got a smile and a hug. Come here, give me a hug, he says. Always there to, always there to pray with you. Come on, let's pray. That's when we start feeling it, and uh, it's a different environment that I'm used to being in the house, you know. These guys generally care about each other. They love each other. You say, good night, love you, brother, you know. Give each other a hug. It's okay to cry. It's okay to, to speak your feelings, and uh, I've never had that. You know, I've never really had family, and uh, now I do. I have all these brothers, and uh, it's, just, it's just been amazing. Um, not on medication anymore for anxiety, depression. I could never sleep at night. Uh, uh, racing thoughts, just so, so much stress that I almost had to be hospitalized. My blood pressure was like 160 over 121 all the time, even though I was on three meds for it. Uh, and... Uh, it's, it's down to normal now. I just, I've learned through the program to leave everything at, at Jesus' feet, you know, that I just trust in him and I don't have to worry about it. I don't have to carry the weight of the world on my shoulders. God will carry it for me. And uh, just blessings upon blessings being here. Um, plan on staying on after I graduate as an apprentice, giving back, helping out. Um, Still homeless, still, still not sure what's going to happen in my life, but I, I just I don't have to worry about that. As long as I'm seeking God, it says, seek and you shall find. As long as I'm doing the right thing, as long as I'm on the right path, you know, God opens doors that no man can close. So I'm leaning on him, I trust in him, and, uh, and I, I trust in the program. It's just been amazing. Um, the scripture I stand on is Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. And it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Thank you.
I also have a, a, a thing to say about the prayer cards. Brother Scott touched on them earlier. We have table out there. One table is for the boards and pens. One table is for books, coffee. And we have prayer cards out there, sponsorships, if anyone feels led to that. But the, the prayer cards are really important to us. Um, like you said, we pray a lot at the house, and we pray a lot over the same group. Guys. Fortunately, we have a new group of, of brothers to pray over now, but for a while it was a core group of guys. And uh, so whenever we weren't feeling it, whenever we didn't want to pray the same thing over and over again, we go to the box, we pick up a prayer card of someone from church. And by doing that, by praying over that, it just, it just gets the spirit moving in that room. It gets us, um, you know, it's better to give than to receive. We feel better when we pray over other people than we do ourselves. So that's a very important thing. It says in the Bible that there is power in the prayer of a righteous person. So we encourage you to please stop by the table, fill out a prayer card. It doesn't cost anything. Um, prayer can only help. And uh, there's a left side for, for your basic information. The only reason we take your information is to keep in contact with you. They'll send you a newsletter once a month. They'll let you know, hey, we have an open house coming up, uh, or we have a banquet, or they'll send you a testimony of someone you didn't hear today, and uh, just to keep in touch. But the right side is, is the important part. It's where the prayer is. Um, anything you need prayed over, health, uh, healing, uh, whatever it is. We see a lot of prayers for other family members, and uh, we've had moments in the chapel, I know I have, where we have a prayer board. We put people up on the prayer board, and we're praying over it, and uh, the spirits come down, and I just know for a fact that that prayer is answered. I can erase it off the board. It might not be that, that exact minute. You know, God's timing is always perfect, but you just know. You get that feeling that 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 prayer is answered. We can go on to the next prayer. So we, we love to have those prayer cards. We encourage that. And uh, that being said, we'll turn it back to Brother Scott. Wow. I, I love the testimonies. I didn't give mine today. You heard a little, bit of my, <clears throat> a little bit of my history. I'm 50 years old, and I'm from a small town called Bucksport, just south of Bangor, Milltown. It, it's amazing to come out each week and be able to give our testimonies and to see the healing in my brothers and to see the progression as well. And it's our goal to come out and spread this word and hopefully helps. I mean, there's a lot of people sitting in the congregation here today that probably aren't dealing with addictions, but may know someone that is. And if we can touch one person through our testimony, then our job is done. But that's not what we want. We want more than that, without question. Because we all have known the stories of someone losing someone. Maybe we have lost someone ourselves. And that's, uh, that's part of the um, worst part of the presentation that I have to do each week. And uh, that's the overdose deaths in Maine. In 2021, 636 people in the state of Maine lost their lives directly due to fentanyl. That's a 23% increase from uh, 2020. Last year, 716 Mainers lost their lives. From 2010 until 2022, nearly 4,600 people in the state of Maine lost their lives from fentanyl alone. We're not talking about any other overdose deaths directly due to fentanyl. And as I had mentioned earlier, that's someone's daughter, that's someone's son, someone's sister, someone's wife, someone's husband. It's a family member. It's, it's the person that you went to the store and bought your coffee from that day. It affects every one of us every day, unfortunately. And that's why we do this. It's, it's, it's our priority and it's our, as I said, our goal and our hope to bring that realization to people that there is a different way. You don't necessarily need the replacement therapies. You don't necessarily need the methadone, the suboxone. The Lord will heal it. It isn't easy, you know. You want to hang on because it's not going to be a fun ride from the start. But if you give yourself, it, it's, it's huge. And, as I said as earlier, this is one of the reasons we come out, to spread the word. It's also to support our ministry. You know, we don't like to go out and thump for money, but it is part of what we do. But there's a lot of ways to support the program, a lot of ways to support the program. As a couple people, my brothers mentioned, and everyone else, we have our products out at the table. That's an easy way, and you're also bringing something back. It's not just 
say, giving a donation, which is another way to, to support the ministry, but you're getting something with it, but you're not only getting something with it, you look at that piece of material and you can say, I helped that person. I just changed their life. And it may not necessarily be the person on the tags that you see on things because they're graduates of the program. Um, but there is someone out there. In just the last week and a half alone, we've had three new brothers come in. We don't ask for money when you come in. We don't accept insurance. This is what we do. We go out, we sell our products, we get private donations. That's how we support our program. That's why we're out here too. Someone did this for us 10 years ago. A few years ago, last week, someone did this for us, so it's our responsibility to do it as well. So I, I encourage you to come out and visit us for fellowship at the very least. Talk to us, ask questions. You know, if you have a question, if you have someone who's hurting, someone's addiction, talk to us. Our program might not be the answer for them, but someone can direct you to somewhere, a resource that can help you. And uh, there's one of the big ways is a sponsorship. You can sponsor a resident, and it's a dollar a day sponsorship, so you're talking $30 a month. Dollar a day, we're looking at, you know, we're looking at a Dunkin' Donuts cup of coffee in a week, just cutting one of those out. $30 in a month, it's more than $30 to take the family to McDonald's. You know, I don't know if anybody's been lately and taking two kids and yourself and your uh, significant other, but you're talking 50 bucks for McDonald's. Come on now, that's crazy. <laughs> but as I said, the products and the donations, you know in your mind and your heart that you're helping someone, you're helping a ministry. Coming up uh, pretty soon, we're gonna be doing a bowling tournament and a lot of people here that are on our mailing list or others, and I'm gonna send you information as well, Pastor, that um, is another way to support. We're also going to be doing an open house this fall that we encourage anyone to come to. See the property. See what goes on there. Feel the faith that's there. It's, um, it's an amazing place. So if it's on your heart to um, come out and do a sponsorship, you know, as pastor encouraged you, a love offering, we appreciate it. Every cent goes back into the program and is used wisely. It's used for our benefit. It's used for your benefit. It's used for our family's benefits and our community's benefits, and that's, that's again, that's why we do this. It's, it's, it's our mission. It's the mission within the mission. So I just, I wanna thank you again, but before I close, I'd like to have Pastor come up. I have a small gift for you, and I hope my discernment was right in that you don't have one of these, at least this one. <laughs> well, if not, you got two now. <laughs> wow, so this you. is the Newport, wow, that's and it's, uh, it's, a multi-species wood, there's, we've got black walnut, maple, black walnut again, this is cherry, and this is purple heart, it's an exotic South American wood from Brazil. We add, have ash, and then it just repeats the pattern. This woman here, Bridget, had been to 17 secular programs throughout the years, didn't work. So she came to Teen Challenge, Adult Teen Challenge, one of the women's centers, I believe it might have even been New Jersey, graduated, stayed on. She's now the assistant director in New Jersey at the Women's wow. Center. That tells you how lives change. Absolutely. She was on the street doing everything she possibly could to get what she wanted. Now she's a director, an assistant director of a, um, of a teen, the teen and women's center. And it's just amazing how the Lord works. So that's what we do and that's what it goes to. But um, I thank you for having us today and bless you all. Thank you. Scott, why you... Let me uh, pray over Scott and this, uh, this team, and also we'll have the worship team come up and we'll close in song. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you. Our prayer at the beginning of this service, even before the service began, was that you would be glorified. That everything would point to you and to the work that you are doing in the lives of your children. God, we thank you for these men who have come here to share their testimonies. God, we pray that the word has gone out and that the hearts and the minds and the ears that have been hearing what they're sharing have been touched as well. As it was already mentioned, God, we know that, that maybe someone here is struggling with an addiction that they need help with. God, we pray that they would have the courage right now to 
Go out and talk to these guys in the cafe afterwards. The same courage that you gave one of these brothers to, to call the police on himself, that they, would, that they would take a step of courage today and reach out for help before that becomes necessary. But God, we also recognize that, that while we might be sitting here and we don't have a, an addiction to drugs or, or, or alcohol, we all struggle with sin. And God, you want to set your children free from all forms of addiction. You want to set us free from all the, the temptations of sin. You want each one of us to wake up and walk by your spirit and to bring you glory through our lives. And so, God, we pray that, that today has been an encouragement to live lives that are yielded fully to your spirit. What we've heard is stories of people who have, who have walked away from the, the, the lust of the flesh and have sought the things of the spirit. And they're, they're leaning into your word where the power comes from. And they're leaning into a relationship with Jesus. And God, we pray that today that our hearts and our minds, our, our ears have heard that and that we're ready to apply those truths to our lives as well. And God, we know that we have an enemy who wants to destroy anything that you're trying to do for good. And so we want to pray for your protection on each of these men. He wants to see them fail but you want to see them walk in freedom. And so, God, we pray for continued strength and we continue to, uh, pray for continued weakness, that they would be weak and lean on you, that they wouldn't become proud, they'd stay humble, and, God, you'd continue to give them victory in their lives. And again, so that in all things you would receive the glory. Build your kingdom in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, brother. Thanks for coming and respond in song and praise God for the incredible grace that he's shown to each one of us amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me I once was lost but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. It was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did
God, we praise you. Hallelujah. Amen. Oh, Lord, we are so thankful, so thankful for the grace that you've shown to each one of us. God, we pray for that continued strength and weakness, Lord. Continued strength to walk with you, but also that weakness to know that we need to depend upon you. God, we love you. Pray for each person here this morning, Lord, that we would walk with you throughout this week, Lord, that we would grow closer to you tomorrow, even closer than we are to you today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have a wonderful week.